communication skills. This is program four, thinking, structuring, and remembering. At the end of this program, you'll be able to channel adrenaline's time warp so that you can think, structure, and remember what you have to say in court. Mindful silence is the secret ingredient in court, and you will learn how to use it to think and control your pace and ultimately persuade. Structured improvisation, not reading and not reciting, will help you think on your feet. We've arrived now at the second big topic embedded in the question, how do you speak persuasively as you think on your feet? What's going on inside your brain? What are the cognitive challenges that you rise to when you stand to speak in court? And just as we did with your body, we're going to take a look inside your brain at what happens when you have an adrenaline rush. When your cerebral cortex is flooded with adrenaline and extra blood flow from the big charge you get from an adrenaline rush, what's going on? What's going on in those deeper structures that can help or hinder you as you're speaking in court and trying to think your way through the case? To find out the answer to that question, let's think about people whom we know, by definition, are having a big adrenaline rush. People who find themselves in an emergency, for example. We know that certain people have to be experiencing a big adrenaline rush. A few years ago, during the Iraq War, I remember reading a newspaper article about what it was like to be inside a firefight. And here's what the soldier said. I heard the first shots and everything went into slow motion. I could see who was on the street, who was on the roof, where were the shots coming from, how much ammunition did I have left, where was the Humvee, where were my buddies that I had just been with. All this happened in a couple of seconds, but for me, everything was slow. That's what people report time and again when they're in the midst of an emergency or when they're having an adrenaline rush. Athletes experience it. They're at the height of a game and they can see things moving slowly they can see the stitches on a baseball coming fast. They can see a tennis ball coming over the net nice and slowly, and it looks big. They have plenty of time to think about the shot they're about to make. What's happening? They are inside a kind of virtual time warp provided to them by adrenaline. Here is what we think the science is behind this phenomenon. Every day, 24-7, your brain is monitoring all kinds of stuff that goes on in your body. One of the things it monitors is the passage of time. It's constantly making an estimate of how much time has passed. And it does this by checking your heart rate. So right now, as you watch this video, sitting down, pretty relaxed, I'm guessing, your heart rate is right around 60 beats per minute. And if your brain is using your heart rate to monitor the passage of time and estimate how much time is passing, you're right on schedule with the clock. But for my heart rate, which is elevated, if my brain is using my heart rate to mark the passage of time, we're not in sync. I think time is passing at a different rate than you do. Are you with me? Our brains use our heart rate to monitor the passage of time. Our brains are carrying out a heuristic, a hunch about how much time is passing. So for me, with an elevated heart rate, or for an athlete who's watching a ball come, we have a different sense of time so that we think more time is passing than you do. 
Same for the soldier in Iraq. Suddenly his heart rate shot up and he had a whole bunch of virtual seconds in which to think. It doesn't matter what a clock would say, and Einstein would love this part. Time bends all the time, and when you're in the courtroom, you're in an adrenalized time warp. In that time warp, you feel very often, not 100% of the time, that time is passing differently, that suddenly you have more time to think. You've been there. You've been speaking to a judge, and he asks you a difficult question. Counsel, why didn't you tell us that this week? Why are we dealing with this issue only right now? And you think, <gasps> I'm thinking, why? Why did that happen, Your Honor? And your heart rate goes up, you have a little adrenaline rush, and suddenly you've been ushered into a time warp. The silence that you take to answer the judge seems interminable. How could I have paused so long before I had a good answer for the judge? Or if you draw an objection, objection, asked and answered, you have that moment of ex accelerated heart rate, a little bit of time warp, and a long silence where you're thinking, everyone thinks I don't know what to say. When is this silence going to be over? This is taking forever. In reality, it's not taking forever. You're just inside the time warp where there's more time to think. It's virtual time, but that doesn't matter. You've got those extra virtual seconds to take a breath, open your hands, and come up with the answer. We know it's in there. We know that if you take a breath, you flood your brain with oxygen so the neurons fire and you can get to the very spot in your brain that knows why the answer to that objection is in your favor. You have to trust the silence. So the very first thing we want to think about when we're thinking, what's the cognitive task of being in the courtroom? You're in a time warp much of the time. The time warp spawns silence. And silence is scary. It's intimidating. We want to rush into the breach and talk faster, fill in the time, talk before we really know what we want to say. That's what makes disfluencies happen, errors of speaking. That's when we feel less articulate, unless we can trust the silence. Unless we can just listen to the sound of our own blood circulating, the sound of our own heart beating, take a breath and come up with the next words. You got to learn to embrace silence and love it so you can live comfortably in this warped virtual time that adrenaline gives to you whether you want it or not. But when you think about it, this is an upside to adrenaline. If you can get used to that silence, that's where you have time to think. That's where you have lots of time to think. All you have to do is make friends with silence. Not only are you thinking, so is the fact finder. Silence and the adrenalized time warp are your very best friend in court. Learn to love the silence and you will speak much better. We focused on what goes on inside of your brain now let's talk about what is going on inside of the brains of your jurors. Silence is when the persuasion happens. Think about it. In fact, every silence implies that very phrase. Think about it, members of the jury. Nobody learns anything from you while you're speaking. No one learns anything from me while I'm speaking. The process of listening requires that as we are talking, we acknowledge that the listener is thinking. And the thinking of the listener needs silence. So in that very same moment when you are answering the question for yourself, what should I say next? The listener in the jury box is answering the question, what did he just say? And am I persuaded by that? And think about how important silence is when you're actually talking to a jury. Chances are, 
these are jurors who did not go to law school, maybe didn't go to college, maybe some of them didn't even finish high school. So they have a very different level of education than you. And I'm not in any way suggesting that you talk down to them, but you acknowledge that this is not their normal way of thinking. In addition to that, they certainly don't know the facts of the case that you know, having now brought that case into court. So even if you had the ability to say it all very quickly, you would leave the listener behind because they need time to process what it is that you're saying. So this notion that there is this silence happening, and in that silence there is this thinking happening, you going forward, the jury going backward. In fact, let's even put a name to that kind of attentive listening that your jurors are engaged in. In cognitive science, it's actually called echo memory, and it is exactly what it sounds like. As you're talking, as you're talking, what they're doing, what they're doing, is echoing back, echoing back what you just said, what they just said. Play that game with me silently. And notice how it's possible in these very short gaps of silence for your very fast brain to echo back what I just said. That's what I mean by that is when the persuasion happens. You need to say it and it needs to go into their heads and percolate down so they can be persuaded by it. They need time to think about it. Let's look at the opposite. When you don't give the listener that kind of time, when you are that kind of stereotypical fast-talking lawyer, well, there's a name for that kind of talking and listening as well, and it's called in one ear and out the other. Think about the fact that I've talked really quick right now and I eliminate those pauses in between what I'm saying, how impossible it is for you to follow what I'm saying. You're certainly gonna very quickly tune out because there's no way for you to process what I'm saying and you think, I am done because that's the classic in one ear and out the other. You're not in any way acknowledging that the listener needs time for that thinking to happen. So silence is the key. And we're gonna get control of that silence before we begin to speak. We're gonna hear that silence and use it, not as a hope that we don't talk too quickly, much more concrete than that. We're gonna hear that silence and we're going to use it. Here's why all of this matters so much. Our brains like information in chunks. It's the human condition. It's actually called chunking in cognitive psychology. And it basically means exactly what it sounds like. Our brains need the information, both as the person doing the saying and the person doing the listening, to be done in digestible chunks. So as soon as you acknowledge that you have that opportunity as the speaker to let that silence happen. That silence, as Marcia talked about, which because of the time warp will seem so long. But of course, it's not. And if you are afraid of silence, if you don't use silence, you will have no time to think. Your listeners will have no time to think. And frankly, what's the point? This is not about you talking. It is about them listening, about them understanding, about them ultimately being persuaded and therefore silence is the key. You're going to use it as a concrete part of your technique. Let's answer two questions about just what kind of speaking you are doing in the courtroom. In trial skills programs, people often say, well, can't I just read it or can't I just memorize it? Let's answer that quest those questions right now. Can you read when you're in the courtroom? The basic answer is, no, you can't. I'm really sorry. None of us are good at reading. You have very few chances in the courtroom when reading will be the best idea. And if you read anything, it should be a fragment of the law, a short statement by a witness, something very short and succinct from a deposition where you can pick up a piece of paper, read it to the jury, put the piece of paper back down again. We just aren't good at reading. And here's another problem with it. Not only do we make fluency errors when we try to read because we read too fast, we just aren't very interesting. Once we start to read aloud, some part of our brain thinks, you can read fast. Why don't you just read really fast? And that makes you talk really fast while you're reading. That squashes out all the expression from it. And then it sounds 
just like you're reading. None of us likes to be read to unless we're four years old and ready for bed in our pajamas. Reading is not a good idea because our delivery is not good. It's dull, it's uninteresting, and it's just too fast. So put that aside. I know it's tempting to read a list of questions. If you have the list, don't look at it while you're asking the questions. You might want to glance down and make sure you covered all the topics. But reading questions is just as boring as reading an opening statement or reading a closing argument. Put that aside and resolve, I'm not going to read in the courtroom. I'm going to be better than that. What about the answer to the question, can't I just memorize this? The answer to that, again, is, sorry, you can't. Why is that the case? Because memorization is really difficult. It takes hours and hours to properly memorize a long opening statement, say, 20 minutes. And then, the next day, you might forget it. Memorization takes many days for it to soak into our brains. And our model for memorization is all the actors we see on TV or in live theater. And we think, well, they do it. Why can't I? Because they have so much more time to do it. In a play, an actor has six weeks or so with the director and the other actors interacting, remembering where they were standing, what costume they were wearing, where they were looking, and who they were talking to. And when an actor walks into the first day of rehearsals and is handed a script, the script is really skinny. It's not very long. Any given actor doesn't have many lines, really. Not like you would have in the courtroom to try to remember an entire opening or a closing or any examination. It's just too difficult. Once you have committed to memorizing something, then you're living in the past. What did I write yesterday, not what happened in the courtroom today that might change what I have to say. So put that aside, too. You're not going to read. You're not going to recite. You're going to do the thing that you're really good at, that you do all day long, every single day, and that is talk. Talk to the jurors. Have a structure, yes but you're not reading or reciting, it's language you are generating on the spot. By the time you get to court, you know a lot about the, your case. You're the expert. Experts can talk for a long time about their area of expertise. That's what you're after. Talk to them. Once you commit to talking to that jury, or talking to those witnesses, we need to decide what's the mental model that you're going to use to do the thinking that leads to the talking. And we call that mental model structured improvisation. And structured improvisation is what you are already very good at, because that's what the human brain knows how to do, and you do it all the time. So you're very well prepared in the sense that structurally you know exactly topic by topic what you're going to talk about, or line by line of questions what you're going to ask a given witness. So it's very tightly prepared in the way of the structure, the big structure. But as to the word by word flow, it's an improvisation. Let me give you an example from your everyday life. Think about if I asked you to tell me an anecdote, something that happened to you, and because it happened to you and it was funny or bizarre or scary, you not only experienced it, but you've retold it. It's that story that you pull out at a party when someone says, well, you won't believe what happened to me one time. Now, you could tell that story because, first of all, there is a clear structure. This happened, then this happened, then this happened. And you could get up and tell me one of those stories. And if I said, wow, that was so interesting, I'd like you to go down the hall and tell another group of people that very same story. But do this for me, please. Make it exactly, word for word, verbatim, the way you said it in this room. And you couldn't do that. because. Our brains aren't good at that kind of rote, reciting from memory, talking. They're very good at saying, well, I could say it again because I know what happened, what happened, what happened. But the words would be slightly different. I might add a detail that I had left out the first time. That's what you have to trust in the courtroom because that's what your brain knows how to do. 
You've never had a conversation with a family member in which you read to them, I suspect. You've never had a conversation with a friend in which you decided to recite. You know how to talk, but now we need to put some structure around that improvisation. So let's talk about the notes that will get you to that kind of a structured improv. And here's my first and most obvious suggestion about notes. Conceive of your notes as a visual aid for you. And what are the rules of visual aids? Well, you write bigger. You keep it simpler because it's bigger, all for the reason that it will be easier to read. Now, perhaps your notes can't be quite this big like my demonstrative aid, and maybe you need more pieces of paper. But there's nothing more comforting than notes you can read. And it's very important to apply to notes that old rule about less is more. The more you write down, the more difficult the notes are and the less helpful they are because there's no time to read. When you glance down and think, oh my goodness, there are sentence after sentence of prose, you don't have time to stop and read. And that will lead you, of course, to start to read to us and that's deadly. So less is more. Do not write good morning members of the jury my name is. You don't need that on a piece of paper. You want to look them in the eye and say that. So first of all, conceive of your notes as a visual aid. Secondly, here's an idea that seems to work for many of the folks that we coach with and that is think about the fact that when we speak and we gesture, we do it as if on this horizontal plane. For example, if I would say to you, I'd like to go to the party, but I'm too busy. On the one hand, on the other hand, none of us would ever say this, would we? On the one hand, I'd like to go to the party, but on the other hand, I'm too busy. That's absurd. So there is this horizontal plane on which we appear to gesture and think. So what if, to accommodate that reality, you did this with your notes, you turned them sideways? What if your notes flowed horizontally across the page? So here's the first topic of your opening statement or your first line of questions, your next topic and your third topic, so that your notes are in effect the same shape spatially as the gestures that you use. So let's start with this as topic number one, and here's topic number two, and now suddenly, oh, I can't remember, where am I in the middle of topic number two? You look down and you know exactly where to look on your notes because they are structured in the way that we gesture. If you've written them out in the typical way of vertically writing down a page, then you're left with that, where am I in the midst of all these notes? So make your notes a visual aid. And then one final thought about this piece of furniture that I'm standing behind. Many judges, especially in federal court, require that you stand behind a lectern. But here's a simple truth about lecterns. Many people stand too close. You want to step away from the lectern, not away in the sense of wandering around the courtroom because the judge may not let you do that, but away in this simple sense. Look at if I stand close to this lectern. It doesn't look strange from your perspective, but look at how difficult it is to see my notes. Where are they? They're way down there. And there's no way that I can sneak a peek because my entire head has to be involved in that process. Step back from the lectern. And now look at how easy it is to talk to you and look at my notes, and talk to you and look at my notes, talk to the members of the jury over there and look at my notes. In other words, now it is only my eyes making that journey and not my entire head. So nothing is more comforting to be able to see your notes easily because you've stepped back from the lectern and you've made your notes big. And that will allow you to engage in this structured improvisation. Let's sum up what you just learned. Talk to yourself and say, Hear the silence in the courtroom before you begin and trust it as you speak. Say that. Stand back from the lectern or council table so you can easily see your notes. Say that. Say this, the adrenaline rush makes time slow down, which gives me time to think. Say that. Insert your first pause after your first phrase to set up a rhythm that works for you. Say that. Now you have new tools for thinking, remembering, and structuring what you want to say every time you stand up in court.